Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. And we're rolling in three, two, one, action. No. <laughs> you know we were rolling the whole time? Yes. Hmm. Very astute observation for a man who was asleep up against his pop filter not 10 <laughs> seconds prior. <laughs> That's not going to be in the pre-show video, is it? Uh, yeah, it probably will. Damn. <laughs> it is 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Brad uh, is a manager in retail, and thus Christmas is hell for him. Happy holidays, everyone. January through August will be gravy, though. Um, <clears throat> what was Evan? What, what did Evan say? Why he couldn't make it? It's we, past his pat. Oh, it's past his bedtime. And we thought he was kidding, and then we realized he's not. <laughs> So we all, uh, we all, as you guys know, uh, we all work full time jobs as well. Because funny enough, the money in podcasting is, I guess it's just a market that hasn't grown into its own yet. But uh, we all, Brad, Evan, and I do this, uh, and this has grown into a big thing, and um, it's amazing. And that means more effort, which is like obviously we've been putting that in. Uh, but from time to time, Evan just, Evan, it's not that he doesn't get it, but Evan just like. He treats it like when we when we were doing this four years ago, you know, when we just started, we were fledgling podcasts at like 400 listens, 500 listens an episode. So uh, Brad and I are often far too tired to explain to him that sometimes we're going to have to stay up past our bedtime like big boys uh, and we leave it to you guys. So uh, shame him on Twitter. It's at Hockey Town Evan. If you're watching on YouTube, we have that little ticker on the bottom that shows uh, all of our Twitter handles. If you don't follow, go follow. Uh, at Hockeytown Evan and tell him how disappointed you are that uh, you couldn't hear him because he didn't want to stay up late. And how much you love when he's on on the episodes and how important it is to hear from him. It really, really gets to him. He'll message in the group for like the first time in two weeks and go, "What? what's happening? Why is everyone tweeting at me? <laughs> The mustache per 60. This episode's way down now. It's way down, which is remarkable because I feel like I have a second mustache growing on my face. I have this is uh day 34 of my beard. There's two things at play here. One, I don't have a functioning shower at home yet. We're still working on that. We have to grout tomorrow and then wait a day after we grout before we can do anything else. Uh, and there's no mirror in our functioning washroom. So I can't clean up the beard, like my neck and my cheeks. Uh, so I must look unruly. But other than that, what do you think of this, the, the longer beard? How does that? You said you weren't shaving it till, uh, the wings win three in a row. The wing, no, the wings win. The wings have a three goal lead and win the game. Oh, okay. You're going to look like a member of ZZ top by the time this is over. Promise. <laughs> and then. The ZZ top line. Wait, no, Zadina. We don't have another Bertuzzi. Zadina. Yeah, yeah, we'll take that. Zadina Bertuzzi Larkin will get us our first three goal oh my lead. God, yeah, we could have had it. I'm even angrier now. Oh yeah, remember we made that joke wh- way back when we. Yeah, talked. but I never actually it never actually registered me that I had another reason to be angry about Zadina not being on the top line. The Winged Wheel Podcast, folks. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm don't, tired. Don't no, you can't go with I'm tired. That's Evan's shtick. I'm Brad. He's he's beat down. I'm a dad. Yeah, you are a father. Brad is Brad was tired and then he made another baby. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is brought to you by Labat. We want you to celebrate with Labat Blue and the Detroit Red Wings all season long. Uh, find your specially designed cases of Labat Blue and Labat Blue Light at your local retailer to hashtag Celion with Labat. Zadina, the Red Wings, the Griffins, wherever they are. Keep your eyes peeled for limited edition team cans of Labatt Blue and Labatt Blue Light, the official Canadian beers of the Detroit Red Wings, and of this all-night podcast. What do we call this? Winged Wheel Podcast After Dark? No, it won't be catchy. It'll not be good for, like, search engine or anything, but it's just kind of funny. <laughs> People are going to think we're going to swear more. That's it. But really, we removed our censor. Like, we removed the only thing that we actually, actually have to censor in Evan. We get those, without saying what's going on, those two people that reached out to us on the week, weekend who want to do it live makes me nervous. 
Wait, what? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a thing we might have to do live, and I'm concerned. Yeah. One day we will do a live recording, although I saw a really funny meme of, like, uh, someone on Twitter, like, they're like, I listen to podcasts as, like, an escape from, like, reality, and then the moment I hear, like, a podcast, like, on a live tour, they're like, skip episode, and I was like, <laughs> a lot of people do that. A lot of people don't like our interviews. Like, they don't mind our interviews, but they don't listen for interviews. They listen for, like, the talking. And for us, we're like, well, you want to hear us? Don't you want to hear from Nicholas Lidstrom, literally one of the greatest hockey players to ever live? And they're like, huh, oh, interviews we've, aren't my thing. We've had so many guests on our podcast that are more interesting and or more funny than us. It's kind of our thing. Like, whenever we have uh, Down Goes Brown or Steve on the episodes, like, we shouldn't even talk. No. No. Like, we should just shut up and let them go. Which is very easy with Steve because, like, we literally can't breathe. Yeah. From the, macar- the, the macaroni the, story. That macaroni. That's the only thing I hate about having Steve on because there is nothing, and I mean nothing, we are ever going to do in the present or future of this podcast that will top the macaroni literally story. Literally never. Literally <laughs> never. That that was our peak. <laughs> The worst part is we didn't even have, like, a good camera, so that, that's not up on the channel, on the YouTube channel. Oh, but it is. It lives on in our ear holes. It lives on in our ear holes. Uh, all right. Funny enough, the Red Wings played one game since we talked last, but there is a wealth of stuff to talk about here. Did, yeah, because they played on Monday. They played the Islanders. Yeah. And it went as you would expect. I'm sorry. I was informed that the Islanders don't score a lot. Everyone, Evan kept saying that. Mickey Redmond kept saying that. Hmm. They don't shoot a lot, which that held up. Yeah, I mean, they scored four times on Detroit. Yeah, uh, you so- need slump busters come through again. Jordan Everly, zero goals on the season coming in. Pots, two. So we're going to talk uh, about that game, upcoming games, and then uh, some roster moves that the Red Wings made, and then... I thought we were done playing or talking about Mike Babcock on this podcast, and um, yeah, it became extremely relevant to the Red Wings again. Um, and I think this is going to be a continuing story, so we're going to cover that. Uh, we're going to dive into Grand Rapids a little bit, talk about the World Juniors, and then uh, some other notable stories around the NHL. Because in addition to being a Red Wings podcast, we just love talking hockey, hockey everywhere. Any and- excuse to talk about happy hockey, I'm I'm here for right now because. Hockey is usually my escape, and it's been a pit of misery for about a month now. The Red Wings haven't won in a month. I haven't played in a month. Every, it's apparently every coach in the world is an idiot. So, yeah, no, I've, I, I'm have i looking forward to the day where hockey is an, an enjoyable uh, escape again. I am uh, I know I bring this up so much, but nothing makes me, like, angry yet, like, makes me laugh at the same time as when we get this those like one off complaints when people say you guys just like when you guys like when the Red Wings are bad so you have a reason to complain. Think about this. We've made this into like a side gig for ourselves. Like it's our passion. Like w- the amount of work that we put in compared to like the output for like almost everything that we make off this goes right back into the podcast. Um and you guys can see that with all the equipment upgrades that we've had. Thank you by the way. Patrons, we love you. Um so this is a passion project, but it takes a lot of effort. So you know that for us to be happier doing this, we want to see the the results be there. If you guys ever want to know the difference when the Red Wings are playing well compared to the difference or compared to when the Red Wings are playing poorly, think about this. Brad, myself, and Evan and the podcast Twitter account jumped 100 followers each. On the day Mantha scored four goals. When Brad and myself, I'm not going to say Evan because let's be real, uh, are like tweet covering a red, normal Red Wings game, like the average Red Wings game this season, so any kind of loss, we'll jump four or five followers each. We jumped a hundred followers each and we weren't even tweeting the game because we were at the damn game. That's the difference. Our biggest week of percentage growth in the podcast history was immediately following the 2018 draft when the Red Wings nabbed Zadina and Valeno. 
the Red Wings being successful and the fan base being happy equals us being more successful and more happy. So if the Red yeah. Wings win the draft lottery, we might end up on TV. <laughs> if, the, if the Red Wings legitimately win the draft lottery, I think that week will be the biggest growth we'll ever see in the history yeah. of this podcast. And we don't like talking shop like this. Like, that's not the point. You guys don't want to hear about us. Like, that's too meta. But, like, just... For those of you who think that we love complaining, please know that this burns our souls just as much. And when we put on happy faces and find silver linings, it is genuinely hard to do. Because I, I legitimately like will ask Ryan after a game, I'm like, did I negative tweet too much during this game? And he's like, well, you jumped nine followers, so no. And I'm like, but it just kills me inside. <laughs> like, There's times I won't tweet for an entire period because I'm just dejected. And then I'm like, no. Wait, I should put something out there. Although I do think it's made us better hockey fans because um, I think everyone should be deliriously hysterical at all times, and that's what we've devolved to. Nice. My favorite game recap I've done all year was the Philly game. Uh, was that the one that where was, you fell was, asleep? It was Black Friday, so I was just, <laughs> it was crazy for me at work. And then I'm like, game recap, I fell asleep for most of it, and I'm deeply grateful for that. What was my reply? A sweet mercy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, boy. Okay, Uh, so the Islanders game, the Red Wings, of course, lost. That was lost 10 in a row, was it? Yeah, they're 0-8-2 now. Uh, They didn't. They played better that game. You know what? They, you're right in that the Islanders didn't don't shoot much. They had more shots. I think the Islanders had more quality chances, but that's neither here nor there. Um... Yeah, they they did play much better. Each progressive game over the past three have been better. The result has been the same. I would say this kind of loss anywhere else in the season besides the middle of a 10-game losing streak would have been much more palatable. But because it's lost 10 after a lot, like I would say 7 out of those 10 were like unbearably ugly games to watch, it just doesn't, You, it's harder to find that solace in it. That being said, Oh boy, are they padding their lottery division lead right now? It's comical. For reference, uh, Montreal Canadiens fans are current. Well, they just ended it, but we're currently losing their minds because the Canadians went on an eight-game losing streak, winless streak, because a couple went to overtime. Mm-hmm. So basically, an eight-game losing streak, and they were saying that is the longest such losing streak for that franchise since the seventies. To which I thought, well, the Red Wings have topped that. Twice this season. <laughs> uh, what's the record? 17 with Washington, I think. Something like that. that. Like losing streak? Yeah. Oh, I think it's longer than that. But something around there. Longest losing streak NHL. Uh, 17 games, 74-75 Washington Capitals and the 92-93 San Jose Sharks. Okay, so. Do you think the Red Wings can beat that? They, they have eight games to do it? All right, let's look at those eight games and you tell me. Well, oh no! They have Pittsburgh Saturday. Hold on. Yeah, Pittsburgh, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Montreal, Los Angeles. All right, Columbus, Toronto, Arizona, Florida, Tampa Bay, San Jose, Dallas, Tampa Bay, San Jose, Dallas, Chicago, Montreal. Oh my God! <laughs> They've got the December from hell. Well, all of these teams look good when you're looking up from ground zero, right? Okay. Uh, Pittsburgh playoff team, Winnipeg, Winnipeg playoff team, Montreal playoff bubble, LA legitimately bad, Columbus fringe playoff team, Toronto good, Arizona near conference leader, Florida very, very good, Tampa very, very good, San Jose very, very good, Dallas very, very good, Tampa, San Jose, Dallas again. Quality. Oh no, sorry, that's only one, it's just repeating in the month, thank God. But then yeah, January lightens up a little bit. But yeah, that's that's bad. That's really Uh, bad. This is a problem. Uh, is it look if your team if you're not team tank at this point i please legitimately send me whatever you're taking i want to try it it sounds fun um because if you're not team tank nothing changes you're just more sad that the red wings are in dead last uh but if you're in team tank you're pumped because uh, the red wings get to draft fourth overall because of course they're going to drop three spots in the draft lottery of course I, i know they are we know they are but that's still a really damn good player and higher than they've picked since, what, Iserman? <laughs> if the Devils draft first overall again, the league will have to change the rules, right? Have to. Because it is not right. It, it is not right that they would get Heischer and uh, Hughes and now... Lafreniere. It's, it, no. 
There's no way. You want to hear my dark horse prediction of what's going to happen? Do you want to hear my no. my happy yet sadistic prediction? What? Red Wings win the draft lottery. Draft by field. Okay. We're still happy. He's great, but he's not Lafreniere. <laughs> okay. I was thinking about that, and depending on how much they value centers, there's it, a very real possibility. Yeah. There are some models that are putting his projected points per game in the NHL higher. I mean, that is so far into the realm of, like, this is a fantastic problem to have. Needle in a haystack in the dark of even close to getting this right. Like, don't put any stock, like, long-term stock into those models. They're more informative than in terms of, than, like, to be used as hard decision making, but still, Byfield isn't looked at lightly. Let's go back to the game. Uh, biggest gripe of the game: Zadina in uh, limited play time with uh, top line players. So the power play uh, again got another point. It was a secondary assist, but he was the prim- primary driver of that play. Yeah, Bertuzzi should have scored that. He ma- he made a perfect pass to Bertuzzi. Bertuzzi didn't score, and Larkin buried the rebound. Oh. What's that? Zadina utilized the two skilled players he was playing with and revitalized a player who's slumping? Hmm. Jeff. Hey, Jeff. What's going on, pal? Because then Zadina didn't play a shift after that play for the rest of the damn period. And what did he finish the game with? Like 11 and a half minutes? 11 minutes. 11 minutes. And for reference, that goal that Larkin scored... Was at 10.36 of the second period. He didn't play another shift that period after setting up a goal. It wasn't a nothing play either. And he he had the, he had sold the goalie on the shot, put a turned the shot into a backdoor pass to Bertuzzi, which by all rights, Bertuzzi should have just tapped into the empty net but fed it right back into uh, Varlamov's pads. Larkin buried the rebound, so we're still happy. But yeah, this is... um, And then didn't play another damn shift... There was one shift in the third period. They put Zadina out with Athanasiu yes. and Philpola. And they didn't score, but they hemmed the Islanders in their own zone for the entire shift and created two high-quality scoring chances off of it. And then he was right back with Nielsen and Helm the next shift. I think I tweeted out. I said, I would accept Philpola, Fabry, uh, Zadina at this point and bump Athanasiu up. Or like... Switch Fabry and Athena to see you. And they did it for one shift and they did everything but score. So, as you guys probably know, uh, the next day, I believe, or the yesterday, uh, the Red Wings sent Zadina and Hiroshi down. And I'll tell you what happened. At first, I saw that and I sent out my reactionary tweet, and I'll give those thoughts again in a second before I realize, oh no, the Red Wings don't play again until Saturday. Grand Rapids plays twice. Maybe they're just trying to get Zadina in as many games as possible. But I will tell you my thoughts on that, just in case they don't bring Zadina back up. I am not upset that they're sending him back down because for two reasons. One, he was thriving in Grand Rapids, and I do think there's merit to the fact that I would like to, like, scoring goals in Grand Rapids might be better for him than playing with two anchored line mates. And two, they're going to obviously call him back up over the course of the season, so it's not the end of the world to see him go up and down. It's kind of a given no matter what happens. Here's the thing, though. What a phenomenal waste of time it will have been if this is not a uh, send down for the week and call back up for Saturday to bring him up just to play him with Nielsen and Helm. What a disgusting waste of time. Telling, preaching, oh, the, the guys have to go out there and earn it, is like telling a, a mechanic that he has to go out there and earn his job and giving him no tools, giving him a freaking pool noodle and, and some wet macaroni to fix a car with. Playing Zadina with Nielsen, who has one point in his last, what, million games? And Darren Helm, who is not a skilled player. I love Darren Helm. I love how he scales his game up based on the people he's playing with. You don't need to pander to the Helm crowd. But he's not a skilled player. He is a third liner at best. The kid is That's not... generous. The kid is not Elias Pettersson. He is not going to drive a line on his own. He needs skilled players, especially at this point in his career. These are his formative years. You're trying to build a foundation for him to work off of in the NHL, and you're giving him Franz Nielsen, who has somehow surpassed Justin Abdelkader as the worst contract on this team, and Darren Helm. 
I'm sorry, man. Darren Helms' specialty, specialty is not finishing chances. Darren Helm has six points in 29 games. and he's oh. Six times more than Franz Nielsen. Yep. Yep. It's... Zadina has what? Six games? Five games? Five games, two points. He has double Nielsen's points, and he has two points. <laughs> in roughly a sixth of the games. I'm sorry. He, he, what do you want from the kid? It's hilarious. And it's not like he's getting any support from the defense either because he can only play so many shifts with Hronik and Chalosky out there. So they're not going to be feeding him. And the, the nice thing is Zadina hasn't looked terrible all these things. Um considered <laughs> i just watched your brain buffer <laughs> <laughs> it's almost 11 o'clock at night i'm tired and angry now here's the thing we last episode we ranted about this whole zadina situation forever and ever and ever and we're going to continue to as long as jeff blashill is the coach i assume Can because use- this this was the same argument we had with anthony mantha and andreas athanasiu for honestly over two years so this is not an uh, as long as this is the coach of the team this is not an argument we're going to have to stop having what I want to talk about, because the one thing the Red Wings are doing well with Zadina's development when he's up is they put him on the top power play unit as the trigger man. Yes. And then they find ways to horribly mismanage the deployment of the power play unit. Absolutely. Units. This is, again, God, I, I hate this and I apologize to everyone because I feel like I keep just coming up with new and creative ways to call Jeff Blashill a bad coach every week and it's honestly not my intention, but <laughs> but there was a moment in that game against the Islanders where I, I I knew two moments actually that I just knew he was hopeless, clueless. Now I'll start by saying this: I don't know how much control Blasio gets over the power play units, the deployment of them, etc., or if this is a Bilesma thing. I don't care which one it is. Whoever it is is failing because every once in a while. On a power play, you have to start with your second unit because if Larkin and Bertuzzi were out for like a minute long shift and drew the penalty, yeah, you can't put them right back out there. They're gassed. So you put the second unit out to start the power play. That's fair. Sure. Any other circumstance, the first unit should be starting that power play and they should be going for a bare minimum minute to minute and a half of that power play. Yeah. There is two moments in this game. The first one was the Red Wings drew a penalty and then it went to TV timeout. Cool. So they're getting a couple minutes to rest here. And we came out of commercial break to watch the second unit start. Did the second unit score? Of course not. Luke Lindenning was on that unit at that point for some reason. Uh, Adam Ernie's been on that unit as well, and he's done nothing. It's Anyways, so there is absolutely no excuse for that. There was another time where it was a power play. The first unit started because they were rested. And there was a whistle... 35 seconds into that power play, they changed the units. And then later in the game, at a justified point, the second unit had to start, and there was a whistle. 45 seconds into that power play, they didn't change. This, even if you agree with Blashill's management of Zadina and like making the young guys earn it, this is the kind of stuff that's inexcusable for an NHL coach. You ride your horses. You don't... There's no reason to keep him in the stable, and that, and he does it over and over and over on, on the power play. One of the league worst power plays. I can legitimately remember the second power play unit scoring one goal this year. One! Here's, and the guy who set it up is in Grand Rapids right now. You want to know what gets me about all this is so much of the roster decision making can be explained by the tank. And it's pretty for it's a pretty foregone conclusion at this point that yeah, Iserman's not looking at like the philosophical should we tank or should we not tank argument. He's going, "No, I want to build the best team I can. This team that I inherited is utter trash in terms of its roster design we have a lot of fixing to do and i want to do what toronto did by acquiring a possible generational talent like they got with austin matthews in the draft why try to win this year i'm not going to bother doing that if anything i'm going to nudge your team downwards that happens at the management level that's where tanking occurs with your management asking your coaches to tank 
mm, doesn't really happen. Asking your players to tank, I guarantee you that literally does not happen. You would hear about it. Players do not go. You see Dylan Larkin. Players do not go out there trying to lose. But because the if they only, went out trying to lose, they're losing money off their contracts. Here, they need points, goals, wins to make money. I have two explanations for, and which leads me to this. I have two explanations for some of Blashill's decisions. One, he is who we think he is, which is just cut from the same cloth as Babcock, not in the ways that we're going to mention, but like in his coaching styles, which are, you know, playing Patrick Marlowe more than Austin Matthews in a game seven when you haven't beat Boston in a game seven in your last thousand years. Or two, he's also in on the tank. That's, that's, the, I'm back to tinfoil hat here. Like, I don't think, I don't, think he's trying to tank but then like these are you're just trying to put out your best team possible it's it's some of this decision making is so bizarre like you can't be that wacky of a talent evaluator where you think that's how you should be deploying your players right it's a small he sometimes does get it right and i'm putting right in air quotations because this is what we perceive to be right and which is not gospel and if it was we'd be working in the nhl right now but you see my point like some of the decisions are so off the board where you're like, what are you getting at here? I don't understand it. For example, um, I don't know if we've talked about this one. It's keeping Philip Zadina with Franz Nielsen and Darren Helm. Can we name two episodes in a row free Zadina? I'm asking for a friend. All it's me. Day. I'm my own friend. <laughs> I need you to take over while I look up Zadina's points per 60 here. It's going to be better than everybody on the Red Wings not named Anthony Mantha in all likelihood. His sample size is small, and he's being hindered by terrible line Well, we could almost do his points per 60 off the top of our head because he has two points, and he's played about 40 minutes. <laughs> he's, I think he averages like 13 minutes a game or something. I'm not sure. Third, his, his time on ice per 60 is like 13 and a half minutes. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, the Red Wings have Pittsburgh before uh, we talk again. So the important thing to note in that game is whether or which of Hiroshi and Zadina get called back up. If it's not Zadina, please apply my rant from before. If it is Zadina, please withhold that rant and apply it at a future date, depending on how they deploy him. Before we talk about it and people start calling me a hypocrite, we have to go on record with these, thing these things now. I would like Philip Zadina to stay in Grand Rapids. I want him away from this tire fire. I want him away from Jeff Blashill. I want him away from everything that was going on with him in the Red Wings. I want him playing in the top six in Grand Rapids. I want him getting a ton of power play time. I want a coach utilizing him to the proper, uh, using his abilities to the proper way. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you. I think seeing Zadina in this stint, I think a lot of his nerves and gripping the stick too tight are not there and i think his original stint with the red wings was still very good but i saw a lot more potential in this one so i want him back up in detroit on the condition that it's in the top six there, I, there it is yeah we, I, I, if 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 you could guarantee me that i would be on your side but that's not going to happen ryan yeah uh zadina with in grand rapids is here and for those of you who are watching, you can see me it, like face level i'm holding my hand at face level zadina with franz nielsen and darren helm plus or minus you know, a couple inches. Zadina on the top line, through the roof. It's just, it makes so much sense. Oh, I mean, he's going to be playing tough minutes. What what difference is it going to make? We're being shelled 6-1 every game. We just got four goals scored on us by a team that takes three shots a game. <laughs> Literally, what is there to lose? He's playing tough minutes. Yeah, he's going to have to. If you're ever going to throw a guy into tough minutes that he's not ready for do it when he's not going to change the outcome of the game because it's pretty much predetermined at this point point. and if that's not a dramatic thing the red wings are legitimately on pace to be worse than the worst team since the last lockout they're on a less than 48 point pace right now oh my god yeah the red wings were horrible last year and finished with 74 points something like that they were horrible horrible and they're, they finished with almost 30 points more than what they're on pace for this year, for perspective. New I, Jersey's being annoying, by the way. With their yeah, well, they're, still, they're still only five points a, ahead of us with three games in hand. Uh, I think it is, yeah, three games in hand, five points ahead. But you know what they did? They fired their coach. They fired their coach. Because you can do that, apparently. I... Don't care about firing Blashill right now. I don't care one way or the other. 
I, I okay. Because team tank. I'm team tank. But if Hiroshi and Zadina and other youngsters are up there, I do care because he's legit. The whole thing that we've been talking about Zadina is the extreme version of what he's been doing, which is hindering their development. He is not a good coach for young players. Who's he, out there? I don't know who's out there. I don't care. Someone who's going to play Chaloski more and mentor him properly. Someone who... Oh, that's what they have those veteran defensemen for, to mentor. They have nothing else to do right now. I swear, one story dropped like in 2004 on NHL.com about a young defenseman who's mentored by like Scott Niedermeyer or something, and it's just stuck in everyone's head that the that teams need veterans to mentor young players. When if anything, that is an accessory in a player development process. That is a nice thing to have, but the training and the growth and the skill development and uh, the the mentorship comes from the coaching and the management staff. The coaching staff should be the ones doing it. He should be getting better during practices and during games from his coaches. Anything incremental from his teammates should be a bonus. You don't make that a priority and your only source of mentorship. Actually, I, that's unfair. It's not the only source of mentorship. These guys are trying hard. But that shouldn't be why you bring guys in. Also... I'm going to make one more point here while I'm sufficiently pissed off. For the Ken Holland apologists, do you see now? Because this is Ken Holland's hockey team. This is Ken Holland's hockey team doing this poorly. I maintain that Ken Holland has done so much for the Red Wings, and he has he is a big, big foundational cornerstone in why they are one of the greatest Red Wings or the greatest sports franchises of all time. I maintain that. But this iteration of the Detroit Red Wings is on Count Holland. This has his stamp on it, and this is the garbage that people weren't seeing because they couldn't see the forest through the trees. This is what Ken Holland's ineptitude bought us. I'm, I like it's harsh, and I'm going to be ripped on for saying that. But legitimately, what else were we expecting? Oh, after Holland's. Other stuff this week. I don't think many people are on Holland's side for anything right now. Although, to give him credit, the, you would also have to give him most of the credit for a pretty strong farm system right now. Sure. Yeah, fine. Whatever. Hard to do when you can't bring him up to the club. Because the coaches. Yeah, no, I no, I know. I know. If if we're keeping all the young guys down in Grand Rapids for the rest of the year, I don't care what happens with Blashill. But if, we're, if we have Zadina or Hiroshi or Svechnikov or whoever up there for any prolonged period of points, yeah. It's a problem, is my point. Let's talk about what you were just alluding to. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Mike Babcock story got bigger this week with uh, Chris Chelios, uh, noted millennial Chris Chelios, based on my mentions after tweeting this out, um, went on spitting chiclets and told some pretty candid Mike Babcock stories. Now, there's a lot of muddy timelines, so I'm just going to do spark notes, and if I get anything wrong, you let me know, Brad. Let me put this ahead of this. For the context of the story... The timeline is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter, no. Ken Holland. Uh, yeah, so the he put stories out there about crap that Ken Holland did. Uh, he tried to Babcock. sit... or Sorry, uh, Babcock did. Uh, a lighter one, like one that isn't as awful as the other ones. Uh, Babcock tried to sit Chris Chelios uh, for the Wrigley Field Winter Classic when he knew that was a homecoming for Chris Chelios and basically management had to fight with him for three days to even let him play. He played him one shift and then sat him the rest of the game. Which, like, okay, that might be a roster move, whatever. Uh, although we've seen this a few times. I, he did it to Jason Spezza recently with the Leafs when he had no reason to. Um, Let's not forget about Mike Medano. 1500th. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then with Franz... Er, Johan Franzen, what was the specific story he told about? Fra oh, he ad he attacked him he, verbally in the room after a game to the point uh, where, and on the bench on the bench to the point where Franzen, who notably for years has had an anxiety disorder, like he struggles with anxiety, might not a, to not to defend Babcock, but there's a strong likelihood he was not aware of it at that point. Ah, uh, he's. It, I might be doing some retconning in my head, but he's always been a notably shy guy, and I think they knew about it back then. Yeah, he might have been shy, but I don't know if there was an anxiety disorder. He definitely knew about his concussions to that point, though. Uh, some of the more major concussions did come later, but regardless, this was a thing. Um, to the point where Franzen had a panic attack on the bench. Franzen then went on to... I'm trying to find the name of, of the, the site where he did the interview, and this site did... An interview with him about his concussions a little while back. 
Um, oh, it was Sport Expressen, which is a Swedish publication. And I'm going to read some um, translated quotes. These were sent to me um, by someone who speaks Swedish who asked to be remain anonymous, but I thank them for their translations. Um, some notable quotes from that interview. And this interview, it was pieced together. It was some of his old quotes, and a lot of it was coming on like right after the Chelio spit and chiclets thing to confirm what Chelio said. So like Franzen corroborated. Uh, he is a terrible... Hu- this is Franzen about Mike Babcock. He is a terrible human being. The worst person I've ever met. A bully who just came at people. It could be the cleaners in the arena in Detroit or whoever. He attacked people just because. I get chills when I think about it. That thing against Nashville in the playoffs. It was rough, scary, and shocking. But that was just one of a hundred things he did. The tip of the iceberg. He attacked other players first, the nice players, those who did not say much. When they disappeared, his energy went over to me and I got my run. It was verbal attacks. He said horrible things. I was scared to be in the arena from 2011 forward. I only focused on getting up in the morning. He said some other things, you know, how he's extremely accurate and prepared as a coach. And he's good at putting together a system and get everyone to buy in. Uh, but he makes his players very anxious and they're scared to make mistakes. And that's why they seldom make it past the first round. Franzen's not the kind of guy who's going to come out and just dish this out. If he didn't have good reason to. If you guys don't like everything coming out about these coaches, you think it's you know people being babies or people airing dirty laundry, listen. This has enabled people like Franzen, who have been seriously affected by this, to come out and not fear being able to tell their story. Now, the, the notable thing here is that Chelios and Franzen and Akeem Alou, these are all guys that are no longer in the NHL. So they have a little bit more of a license to do this. But it is still a good thing that these are coming out. Mike Babcock leaving the Detroit Red Wings voluntary, voluntarily might have been the biggest blessing this team has had since their last cup. Yeah, I could see that because now the question I want to ask and the thing that's going to piss me off the most about this entire story, actually the thing that will piss me off the most about this entire story hasn't even happened yet. How long is it till Babcock gets hired again? Despite the fact that now it's obviously worth pointing out that this is all just people telling their side of the story. And when people tell their side of the story, they could always lie, exaggerate, yada, yada, yada. I think we can piece together enough of these stories from all these people to know that Mike Babcock's just a terrible, terrible human being. Like, just barely any redeeming qualities as a person. Um, But even knowing all this, he's going to get another job in the NHL. I want to know. Like, I want people to know that we're not going on here pretending that we knew this. This is a, this is a surprise to a lot of people. We knew that uh, players sometimes had a hard time playing under Babcock because he was tough, but we didn't know that it went further than that. We knew that players didn't want to come to Detroit in free agency because they didn't like playing under Babcock, but we just assumed that was a run of the mill. This is a tough guy to play for. I mean, we grew up watching Scotty Bowman, right? And that's a notoriously tough coach to play for. Um, we did not know all of this. But knowing it now, yeah, this is garbage. This is utter trash. I actually think it's going to be some time before he's hired again. I think there has to be a whole, like, I'm not kidding when I say if Babcock wants to coach again, what he's going to have to do is hire a public relations firm or company, and they're going to do a whole image recovery thing. He's going to make amends, be part of the reparations with the league, uh, do a media tour, advocate for mental health, talk about his path to getting better. There's going to be a lot of features. He's going to show up with a lot of like the big hockey media guys, TM, are going to do a lot of features and interviews with him where Babcock's going to come off humbled and own up to his mistakes. And he's going to do all of that. And then that'll be enough for the team that wants to, to hire him, the New Jersey or the Seattle, whoever, to say, yep, yeah, this, that's enough. We think he's a better guy now. It's f- uh, not funny. It's almost sad that he's been one of the bigger advocates of mental health initiatives in the NHL over the last decade or so. He's a big one on the Bell Let's Talk movement, and here we are. Everything you said is right, and all of it's going to happen, and I don't think it's going to take nearly as long as you think. I think he won't have a coaching job next season, but I'll bet she's back the year after. 
Um, I could see him taking a consulting position with like Hockey Canada. He was offered positions right off the bat, and he said he wants to wait. I could see him taking a consulting position with like the World Juniors or like something like that. Oh, my favorite thing is, did you see whatever? What is that NHL Coaches Association released yeah. a statement? Did you ever? Did you dig in? Did yeah. you Did you see who was on their executive board? <laughs> Bill Peters and Mike Babcock. <laughs> It writes its. <laughs> I'm the too... Onion and the Beaverton are legit. They must not staff writers anymore. They must just copy and paste articles and, and and submit them. I am quite literally too tired for this shit. Um, the other thing that came out about this that's very concerning is, it was said that players brought this forward to Holland. Specifically, not even just that Babcock was tough. Like before, we knew that players tried to get Babcock fired, and Holland refused. That, that was, was one Cole Yakovo's story, just to keep all our Babcock stories in a row. Which, like, oh man, are these waters muddy? Um, but it was suggested, I believe, by Chelios that these some of the horrible things that Babcock did were brought to light to Holland. And now Holland has denied some of this. He said the specifics weren't exactly brought up. They were just general complaints or something like that. There's been a lot of denial. And Holland has, I'm going to say smartly, and I don't mean this in a, like, a positive way, but smartly for himself, refused to comment on a lot of things so as to not implicate himself, which, I mean, you know, he's protecting himself in that. I don't, I would love to know the truth of it. I think we all would, but for him, I guess, smart move. Um, but Holland has kind of denied it and said that he said to players that if you ever want to come and tell me something, uh, you can come tell me. Or if you, even if you want to request a trade, we can do it in my office and it'll be private. And I promise it'll be a secret conversation. That's not exactly what the players who are speaking out have said. This is an area where I genuinely don't know who to believe. I don't want to believe that another one of these idols for Red Wings fans growing up with this team is Im- implicated in this. It already hurts that we grew up watching the, the Litstroms and the Zetterbergs and all these leaders on this team. And this happened. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into the very dangerous game of not blaming the people who are the perpetrators of this, but the bystander effect is real. And it is one of the biggest factors in the, uh, perpetuation of bullying it's it's just bleak you know you read it and you're just like man man i feel bad i just feel bad it feels bad to read about it It feels bad to know that this is happening i feel bad for johan friends and that guy deserves nothing but good things to happen to him and he has just had such a shit run and i hate knowing everything that he's gone through and he also had this garbage thrown at him from mike babcock that just sucks right in hindsight, though, it makes that uh, his old Instagram post about buying Gustav Nyquist a Babcock blanket when he went to Toronto that much funnier. Yeah, well, significantly funnier. It's nice that the team found camaraderie and how much they hated Mike Babcock. <laughs> um, although, it does. I think the biggest indicator that uh, Ken Holland was acting how he was being described uh, is not the fact that other players are corroborating it. It's the fact that Ken Holland from 2011 to whenever he was let go in 2019, that was this year, mm-hmm. oh my God, um, he only ever acted in the team's long-term disinterest, both in roster decisions and in not firing Mike Babcock when the players desperately wanted him to. So that's all the evidence that you need right there. Oh, boy. Oh, and also Mark Crawford's on the leave now because apparently he's got a bunch of accusations about kicking players and yelling at them and all that. Someone, yeah, one of the replies to because I I posted the 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 fronds and translations and it got picked up and so you had the general population of Twitter in your mentions, which let me tell you, you do not want that. Twitter is free and we're reminded of it daily. Yeah. Um, he this guy goes, oh, this is just another case of millennials being too soft. Blah 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 blah. I'm like. Chris Chelios is like 500 years old. <laughs> he is uh, an ageless god. I mean, the guy's in better physical shape than half the guys in this league. But did you just call Chris Chelios a millennial? You absolute dolt. You worn out, rusted over, painted with two gross colors, chipped away brass doorknob. You stupid, 
pile of terrible thoughts. You just called Chris Chelios a millennial. Are you kidding? And isn't Johan Franz in like 37? <laughs> Since when is not liking being punched in the head in the back by someone who has power over you? Abuse. Someone goes, oh, they're making a lot of money to be complaining. Bro, what? No one's saying, what? First of all, do I have to say this? Mental health does not give a shit how much money you make. Do you think Franzen's anxiety disorder cares about how much money he makes? Ah, I mean, this guy whose brain, whose head I occupy, makes a hell of a lot of money, so I'm not going to make him just shut down and panic sometimes. No, obviously not. Are you kidding? And if you, like... If you made that much money, do you think those players sign? Like, do you think they do no work? This is their market value based on today's market. Whether you think professional athletes should be paid that much or not, they're doing a job that is worth X amount of money. It's not, hey, once you start making over six hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, you get the shit slapped out of you by your boss, and you can't say anything about it. You little bitch. That was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got carried away there. We try not to swear as much, yeah. and I'm sorry for the, the kids listening. It's to really send home the absurdity of that statement. Oh, the and the rest of Sean Avery's quote was just absurdly hilarious. Oh, so do you think uh, that abuse uh, from Crawford lets you being traded? And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I got into a scrap with the assistant coach of <laughs> yeah, practice. Yeah. That's why I got traded. I'm like, I, I appreciate your self-awareness. Uh, it's just so agitating. Okay. Uh, undoubtedly, we're going to have more on this. I hope not. Please just let it end. Hey, for a guy, you know what, Brad? Uh, I'm going to say some nice things about you before calling you stupid. You're really good at podcasting. I think you like you and I and even Evan have this thing nailed down. And you're, you're a smart hockey mind. And you know you have a good feel on what's what in the hockey I world. Know there's going to be more, Ryan. <laughs> I'm hoping there isn't. It's like... The RFA story that you wanted to avoid all summer. You're like, I'm not talking about this anymore. I'm like, he must know that's the biggest story in hockey right now. <laughs> like, why do you go in these uh, futile states in your head where you're like, yeah, I can avoid talking about this. You big dummy. I don't want to. If I was a podcast listener, I wouldn't want to listen to this anymore. It's just. Can we just talk about Alexi Lafreniere for a bit? Uh, in a way, let's talk about the New Jersey Devils. Um, Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> The New Jersey Devils. God um, damn it, Ryan. I'm trying to not swear anymore. Uh, have heard us to say that they were a dark horse to get better this season or say that they would get better this season. I've quite obviously been terrible. Uh, the experiment was sending their assistant GM to the uh, bench to see what the problem was. I can't remember that assistant GM's name uh, has concluded. And the result was they fired head coach John Hines um, about check notes uh four weeks too late so with the new jersey Devils season all but unsalvageable they have uh promoted assistant coach uh elaine nasadir nazardine nazardine um which i mean for all us arabs out there represent that might be the one of the first arab head coaches i know he's from quebec but i know what i said um a lot of devils fans that i've talked to have said he was kind of more the same he's a john hines slash ray shiro disciple so we'll see where that goes uh, i don't anticipate new jersey doing anything but tank new jersey is gonna win the freaking draft lottery again and they're gonna get alexi lafreniere and they're gonna get halls hughes lafreniere so or sorry uh, uh he sure hughes lafreniere and taylor hall you remember last year that game the red wings had against yep yep I uh, sure do. The Devils around sure this do. time of year were Rasmussen tied it late, and then uh, Detroit ended up winning in overtime. And you know that one point in the standings was the difference between Houston. Okay, we just had another game against New Jersey not that long ago, around the same time of year, and Detroit lost. We're doing it right this year, Ryan. We've got this. Look, if we're not, we're we're picking fourth. But as long as it's not New Jersey, if New Jersey wins it, I, the league would will literally face riots if they don't change the lottery system. They have to. They like legitimately have to. They I, want, Edmonton uh, says no. Okay. Uh, um, one thing. Did you ever used to watch the TV show Fringe? Yeah. Um, you've seen all the pictures and the interviews with John Hines and Stephen Fired, right? No. Well, you've seen John Hines. Yeah. Yes. He's an observer, right? I don't know if I watch enough of Fringe. The observers? Okay. Or li for the listeners, you can comment on this. He's an observer, right? We know this. Hmm. I'm going to look this up because this seems funny. 
Um, quality joke. I'm, I'm a little upset. The Devils, the other notable story for the Devils is that Hall is firmly on the trade market. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. Hall's uh, decision on whether or not to stay with the Devils was going to be contingent on whether or not they're going to be a good hockey team. They acquired the players, but apparently not the team as a whole. And so they're garbage, and Hall is going to leave because he wants to play playoff hockey. He has one playoff win and he's 28 years old so you can see why the guy wants a change of scenery okay before all the hall rumors start because i've already seen very very stupid tweets and posts from very very high-ranking hockey writers so i I'm, I'm gonna get this out of the way right now taylor hall is an exceptional talent an amazing player one Hart, of the best left wingers in the world heart trophy winner shouldn't have won that mckinnon should have won it but whatever the fact he's even in the conversation says everything you need to know The team that is going to be trading for Taylor Hall is obviously going to give up heavy assets. But not that heavy because you're basically trading for three months of Taylor Hall. Do people forget that he's a rental? You are not getting eight years of Taylor Hall in this trade unless it's a predetermined sign and trade like Vegas did with Mark Stone last year. But may I remind you all how rare those are because players like going to free agency and having the world of options available to them. The sign and trade of Mark Stone last year was the exception to the norm. Stop saying, if you're the Vancouver Canucks, do you trade Quinn Hughes or Elias Pettersson for Taylor Hall? Of course you don't. They're a lot younger than him. You could even argue they're better than him. Maybe not yet, but will be. And you're not giving up a future piece of this significance for three months of Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall is going to require north of $11 million. That's just the market. for. If you want one of the best forwards on the planet, you pay north of $11 million. That's what he's going to get. Um, a team is going to give him seven or eight years of that money. And, and regret it four years in. You know what? He might be such an exceptional talent where he could be like a 50, 60 point player in the in the late years of that. Based on the style of game he plays, I would not bet on it. Um, but if you're a team that thinks that your window is four years long, perfect. And you need to sign Hall, and Hall's not going to sign for anything less than the longest contract possible with the most money, then you say, yeah, forget it. I'll overpay you grossly for three years because I want to shoot for my window. Because. What is success in this league if it's not winning a Stanley Cup? You, people don't care about PDO. People don't care about expected goals for. People don't care about winning your division. You win the Cup or you fail. That's it. The, the Leafs are putting together literally the greatest roster in their history. And if they don't win a Cup, they'll be forgotten. I mean, they won't. They'll make 30 for 30s about how this roster couldn't win a Cup, but I digress. Um, they have uh, so almost as good a chance of winning the draft lottery right now. Stop that. Uh, so if the team, if a team wins or if a team wants to win and has a window of like two to four years, I could see them overpaying for Hall. Uh, the Red Wings cannot even begin to talk about a window until two years from now. You guys might not like that hearing that. I know a lot of people don't like hearing that, but look at this team. It's going to take a lot of undoing before there's any doing. Uh, can we please, because I've received several tweets about it. No, the Red Wings will not be trading for Taylor no. Hall. Yeah, and that's Stop. what all this was leading up to. Stop. No. I can't. I stop. Okay, uh, we're gonna because it's late and we're gonna run past midnight here because we got a hell of a lot of Patreon comments. Uh, we're gonna head over to overtime, which is brought to you by Motor City Garages. They are a family-owned and operated business servicing Metro Detroit. Uh, they do garage flooring, cabinets, overhead racks, wall storage, um, preventing people from stupid Taylor Hall trade rumors, uh, and everything to do with your vehicles. Enough of the messy garages everyone is sick of walking through. It's time to turn it into something useful. Whether you like to work on your car. Or if you'd like an organized space, we have you covered. 3D designs and a lifetime warranty. Motor City Garages. Park in style. This is a midweek episode, which means we are heading over to Patreon, where their comments uh, get read out on air, and they are the only overtime comments we take for our midweek episodes. This is a healthy one. Yako Ruta says, Why is Mark andre Fleury considered a Hall of Fame lock? He has never been a Vezina finalist. His career save percentage is 913, and he has a save percentage of over 920 only three times over his career. Uh, Stanley Cups is the answer. He's a winner. 
And that's what the Hall of Fame cares about. They care about wins and Stanley Cups. And that's why. Also, 913 career save percentage is really good. It's not bad at all. Yeah. Uh, Matt McKay says, uh, hey, guys, hope all is well. And I'm excited to see what the new table will look like in the new studio. I want to keep it positive with this one. What is one of your favorite uh, hockey-related memories you have? It doesn't have to be Wings-related. Mine is when I got to stay up late with my dad and watch the Wings beat Schittsburg in 2008. It was awesome to see them win and to get to spend it with my dad uh, was well worth it. Thanks for all you do and hope we get to talk about a Wings win sooner rather than later. Cheers. Um... One of my favorite ones, uh, this would have been one of my last years of minor hockey uh, without getting into detail. Kitchener hosts a very famous tournament every year. And it was my first year dating Crystal. She and a bunch of my friends and her friends came to watch the finals because my team made it. And we got an early power play in overtime. And I ended up uh, coming across the net as a pass from the opposite point was coming to me. Instead of deflecting it, I held it, came across the crease, stared at an empty net, put in the overtime winner to win the tournament. And as I turned, because, you know, when you score that goal of significance, you don't slow down, you speed up, you're skating. And as I was coming up the boards, right where my teammates mobbed me was right in front of where all my friends and Crystal were, so I could see them all going nuts. So I saw them, then looked to my right and just got hammered by my teammates in the boards. That was really cool. Uh, Mine was the O2 Cup run. Game seven against Colorado, watching that seven nothing win was glorious. I also like my dad and my brother and myself and my my mom and my sister, but like we, I whenever I get to go home and watch a Red Wings game with my dad, it like it means a lot. And that was one of my favorite memories watching that game all together. Um, and that was I think the best team to ever play in the Did NHL. Did I ever tell my story about that game on here? Maybe because my my story with that game is hilariously stupid and very on brand for a dumb high school kid. I didn't see that game. What? I was on my first ever real date with oh, a girl you that told, night. You yeah. told us that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I never saw that game. I caught the highlights after. <laughs> Don Mitchell says, "Do you think uh, that the no such thing as bad press thing doesn't apply to the NHL? I mean, being in the states, the huge unnamed sports channels, no free ads, have never had discussions over the NHL other than players killing themselves from head injuries and now coaches being abusive and racist." Not how many goals Pasta is on pace for, or not that how the Coyotes are a point from being first in their division, and definitely not uh, how we'll be getting a Seattle team name in a month or so. But Sidney Crosby is still great. Oh, he said Sidney Crosby. Yeah. Uh, how likely will we be seeing Zadina called back up immediately after this stupidly quiet week? I mean, everyone other than the hosts knew the move was because of zero games this week. Listen, sir, I caught it after a couple of minutes. The highly anticipated return of the memorabilia question. With the open house being completed Tuesday night, whose line uh, would you wait in line for uh, for an hour to get only one thing signed? What would you get signed? Cheers, Don. Uh, full team sitting there. I mean, it's Larkin. If it's the team, uh, you go you go Larkin. Uh, he'll have the biggest line, though, so you kind of got to get your value signings in here, too. Uh, I assume Mantha's line will also be very long, so... That will probably not be the greatest. Where I think your value signings are relative to uh, quality of signature versus length of line, I think Athens, you, and Heronic are going to be your sweet spots. Um, if we're going anyone, Lidstrom, and I want my Winter Classic jersey that Rowan gave me signed. Jacob Lozen says, good morning, Dud Duds. We're past the Thanksgiving Day break. Assuming the prophecy and stats are true, the teams that are currently in playoff positions will indeed make the playoffs, meaning New Jersey should not be able to make a comeback, right? Oh, it would be a significantly bigger comeback than even St. Louis if New Jersey comes back. Uh, Meaning Taylor Hall should be one of the bigger trade pieces come the deadline. What team that is currently in the playoff race will land him? Uh, Also, at what price? Friend of the pod, Steve Dangle, thinks Colorado. I've also seen that. Um, There's been a few teams emerging. um, Which makes sense and disgusts me at the same time. What are your thoughts? Colorado has a wealth of defensive prospects. Uh, We're not talking Kale McCarr here. But you have Gerard, you have Connor Timmons, yeah, the, Paul Byram. Although that's too much of a price to give up for a rental. Byram and McCarr are off the table, but you you package Gerard or Timmons, and then you have some pretty valuable picks too. I uh, Colorado's in the best position and makes a lot of sense for Taylor Hall, but I'm Team Chaos, and one of the teams that's been rumored to be very interested in yep. Taylor Hall and would have the assets to do it, the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> I want nothing more in my life than Taylor Hall to go on a playoff run with the Oilers this year. It would make me so happy. And it would be great if Ray Shiro fleeced them. 
Oh, yeah. A first Yessi Puyi and Evan Bouchard. Like, just do it. Can you imagine? Who's... Hey, if only they had a GM who was absolutely horrendous at overpaying on deadline trades. <gasps> okay. In fairness, he also got a first, a second, a third for Tatar. He got two seconds, was it, for yeah, when he's on the, Brendan Smith? When he's on the selling end of it, he's great. When he's on the buying end, they've all every one of them was bad. Simon Anders said, said, should Ryan be called Elliot Friedman now? Because I'm pretty sure he was the first to tweet Johan Franzen's quotes translated into English with almost 3,000 likes and over 600 retweets total. Really? Holy shit. Uh, on all the translated tweets, he almost broke hockey Twitter, bud. In all seriousness, it felt good helping you with it and getting... Oh, yeah, it was Simon. Uh, and getting it out there as fast as possible. And yes, let's refire Babcock. Keep up the good work, boys. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I, I tweeted it as I was leaving work, and it, like, it was like a normal tweet. And I went home, and I saw... like um, I'm forgetting the names. But someone picked it up, and I was just like, oh, boy. Yeah, I'm putting my phone away for a little while. <laughs> we were uh, Mel and I were watching something on the Chromecast, and I had my phone on the wireless charger. And I was like, "Has my battery not moved?" She goes, "Your phone hasn't stopped buzzing." I'm like, "Yeah, it's Twitter." You leave your notifications on for Twitter? Yes. You are a crazy person. Yes. I haven't had my Twitter notifications on on my phone in at least four years. K Stenji says, since rooting for our wings these days is a depressing affair, who are your second teams, secondary teams that, if the wings aren't playing, or let's be honest, even if they are, you will turn on their game to watch? Uh, I'll always play a Vegas game. Vegas, Edmonton, Carolina. Those teams, yes, I agree completely. And in a sick way, I like watching the Toronto games, not because I root for them, but because they have a ton of talent. And I always want to see how that storyline goes. Uh, Colorado lately, as dirty as that makes me yes. feel. Colorado also. You, Kale McCarr is one of the most exciting players in the league to watch. Nathan McKinnon. Um, I'll also put on Vancouver games just for Hughes and Pedersen. Yeah. Uh, Garrett TV says, Hockey Amigos, Blashill isn't going anywhere this year, and while I don't want him long-term, I'm okay with that. I'm with you, pal. However, what do you think about Bilesma and Huda? Usually you fire assistants when you want some change, but you don't want to bag a head coach, and if you look at our special teams, particularly Bilesma's power play, they're god-awful. The power play has been complete frickin' garbage for at least three years, and we definitely have the talent to be better on the man advantage. Blashill's good for the tank, but Bilesma might not be good for anything. What say you? Hashtag can Disco Dan. Let's go Red Wings. Here's the thing. Getting rid of assistant coaches is a way to try to salvage a head coach's job that's pretty well known. Uh, they've already done that with Blashill. They've already cycled through. He's. Yep. They've used that card. If they're at the point where they're about to file Bilesma and uh, fire Bilesma and Huda, Blashill's got to go too. So yep. I'm I'm pro. If they're gonna fire him, I'm not gonna be upset about it. But I also, whether or not he's truly a good coach who's just been ha uh, had a raw deal or a bad coach, I don't care because the results are good for the team long term right now. As much as it hurts us in the moment. Cody G says, lots of stuff coming out about coach abuse. Do you guys feel it will slow and fade away, or will we continue to hear stories about other abuses, even about other coaches? Yeah, we will not stop hearing about this for a long time. Maybe not like at the, the peak right now, like this is the hottest topic in a long time, uh, but they're going to be rolling out continuously. It might not all be at the NHL level either, no. worth noting. Uh, I'm wondering if this is possibly the start of a shakeup of the old boys coaching club. As more coaches are called out for their treatment of players, I'm guessing the NHL will have to respond with some sort of new standards responding to the public mob. And many coaches who have been around for a while may be replaced with up-and-comers with just without as much of a track record. Just my thoughts. Cheers, I'm boys. Enjoy the warm weather. We're warming up to minus 10 Celsius out here, which will be a nice break from the minus 30 we've had the few weeks, last few weeks. Fun fact for those in Fahrenheit, I believe minus 40 Fahrenheit is minus 40 Celsius. So. so that's where hell meets up. It's currently freezing right now. Haroon Khan says, hey, guys, I know this is a repetitive question, but when do you think Detroit is going to be on the upward trend? I like to think next year, but that's my inner positivity. What's the outlook? I, it, they're literally on pace for a record-settingly bad season in the modern NHL. There's nowhere to go but up right now. I believe this team to be at true rock bottom right now. I think there's a chance... And I'm not going to say this a lot because it sucks to think about it and people are going to get mad. I think there's a chance next year might be almost as bad. Um, I don't see how much this team will change. I think I think they'll be bottom five bad still. They'll be bottom five bad. I don't see them being this bad because the natural progression of some of their young players will just be too good to keep them this bad because some of the holes that the Red Wings – glaring holes have on this roster will be plugged in by rookies next year now they're rookies so you can't expect the world of them but they'll be an upgrade 
Uh, you'll probably have Moritz Sider playing a regular shift because he's been nothing but unbelievable in Grand Rapids. Zidane is a full-timer next year no matter what. Um, we might see a Rasmussen or a Valeno full-time as well. Maybe Svechnikov. These guys are all going to be young rookies. Can't expect a lot, but they are all upgrades on the Adam Ernie's and the Franz Nielsen's, the who the hell ever they are replacing, they will be upgrades on. So they will still be bad, but they will not be 47-point pace bad. Arjun Shanker says, I tweeted this suggestion, but I haven't seen any response to it yet. If Brad has to pay into the penalty jar for talking about the Bills, can Evan pay for talking about golf and Ryan when he finds ways to bring up the fact that he's in a happy relationship? Hashtag curmudgeons against happiness. Uh, I also think we should have our jar like on screen during the episodes, and we should all come with change every episode. So when I mention the 9-3 and three Bills, I just have to put yeah, it in? That's money in the jar, Brad, yeah, you okay. pile of garbage. <laughs> They're the only professional sports team I cheer for right now that's making me happy. The Red Wings suck. The Blue Jays suck. The Raptors are actually pretty good, but I don't follow basketball that much. The Kitchen Rangers, junior team, supposed to be good this year. They suck. Everything sucks, Ryan. That's what you get for I mean, following Toronto teams. Why don't you follow Detroit teams? So I take that back. They they also suck. The Buffalo Bills are my that's lone source one of happiness. That's another one in the jar. Do you know? It's more in the jar. It's Do you per, know how it's far down the thing. rabbit hole you have to be? You're down. You're down a couple bucks in the jar, Brad. You literally can't afford this conversation. I've seen how much your kids eat. <laughs> Tim Henderson says recently, Wings for Breakfast talked about play systems. What are your opinions on what system the Wings should be shooting for to better develop players with the skill and talent the Wings have right now? Anything but what they're doing. They play such low event hockey that it benef- from a skill development standpoint. This benefits no one. This is how to basically, this is over-exaggerating, but this is basically how to not play the game. We are going to slow it down so much that if the new coach or whatever, when you get good, you do want to play higher event hockey, it's going to be shell shock for all these guys. They're not going to know how to play that fast. I want them to play fast, upbeat, aggressive hockey, and they're doing none of that now. I want heavy forecheck, defense activated, quick through the neutral zone. Defense activation is huge for me. Quick break, and the Red Wings do literally none of it. And you could argue, yeah, well, do the de- Red Wings have the defense to really activate? No, of, of course, course not. not. But I still want them to learn it because here's, and I'm sure this is a point Ryan's about to make, and I'm about to steal Slender. I don't care. <laughs> He's talked more than me this episode. I'm getting this one in. <laughs> the Red Wings are uh, record setting bad right now. There's no reason to not try something else. That's it. That's my entire argument. If you want to literally say, we're going to try it, nothing, we're going to basically play a five-on-three defensive system and just keep two forwards at the far blue line and ice it to them so they have a two-on-0, fine. Do it. I don't care. Try something else. Uh, you know what's funny that I've noticed regarding systems is that uh, I think the Red Wings this year, there's been a difference because before they used to just run the systems of like a super skilled team that you know could also grind it out when puck battles in the corner with, when ryan well, like way like way back when they like i'm talking 2010 they used to be that oh team. Yeah, yeah you know when they were good but they never changed that system so like up until like last year a couple of years ago it'd be like the dump and chase or like dump in with the deflection in and that kind of garbage or like give it to one guy assuming that he's going to be datsuk who's going to dangle through the whole neutral zone and your zone entry is literally just a cheat code um I now see them try to deviate away from that a little bit, but they try to do things that they don't have the personnel for. Uh, one example, and it's an easy example, is the stretch pass from your own zone to your guy at the opponent's blue line, and then the drop back to the player catching up. But like, oh, on the power play? Yeah, yeah. No, they've never tried anything other than that. But the player catching up is like Mike Green, who's, I'm sorry, not a good skater at this point, or like it'll be Hironic who makes a mistake or maybe gets it like one time or it'll be, it'll go back to Hiroshi, which like bless his heart, but he doesn't know how to run his own entry on his own. And sometimes they, they try these super advanced plays and you're like, well, what are you doing? Another thing is like on the five, there's just sometimes where it looks like they have no system. You're like, what are you, what are you getting at here? Uh, they were on a five on three a little while ago. And what did they do? They tried to force passes through a clogged, clogged uh, danger area. Like they, I can't remember who they were playing, but they had all three players in that high danger area. Move it around the perimeter. Cycle it around the perimeter. Move your damn feet. There's five of you and three of them. Make them move, then create the holes to pass it through the neutral zone. They all stood stationary, did not generate any kind of movement from the defense, and passed it right to them, and they cleared the puck. 
It was nuts to watch. All they run on the power play is the umbrella and nothing else. And the fact that they don't ever utilize a down low play or behind the net or below the goal line, goal line infuriates me. Because we remember how excited we were. On the five on three in the game we're at against Dallas, that I'm going to call it a wheel play. They ran that teed up Mantha and Hudobin just made a crazy save. Me and you both looked at each other and went, oh. That, that was, was the nice. most beautifully designed play I've seen the Red Wings run in a decade. They've not even attempted anything like it once since then. And you know what? Every single player who touched the puck on that play moved their feet and was in a different position than when they started. Mantha started the play on the Far wall. right half wall, yeah. and he was the trigger man on the top of the left circle and the play was done. Yeah. It it and was he's a big beautiful boy. He up his feet. Why do they and the whole play was predicated by a down low pass to the right corner below the goal line. Pass went behind the net to below the goal line on the other side as Mantha was wheeling around coming in top speed. They utilized behind the net and it worked perfectly. The only reason they didn't score was Kudobin pulled the save of the game out of his ass. Yeah, the thing that gets me about this play that we're describing right now is it was such a nice play, and it was not a fluke. Like, this was a set play. Where did that go? Where is that? I have not even seen them try it since, and we've watched every game. Between the two of us, we've watched every game. Have not seen it once. We're going to move on. Antonio Gracias. Oh, man, Tim, you brought up systems, and now we're... Whew. Antonio Gracias is reading all the news about Babs and other coaches. Yikes. I would imagine you guys will have talked to this topic of the ground, so let's change things up. If you're in charge of the roster spots slash lineups and you could use all the wings and griffins, what are your lineups looking like? What are some of the reasoning behind your choices, i.e. experience, winning, developmental, etc.? Uh, assuming health? Yeah, assume health. Um, I don't are we care. assuming Blashill stays as coach? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the top line stays together. Uh, Mantha Larkin Bertuzzi. Second line stays together. Philip La Athens to see you. Uh, Fabry. Third line would be, I don't give a sh uh Perlini, Herosi, Nielsen. Fourth line, I don't give a shit. All the kids are in Grand Rapids. All of them. Uh, I see Zadina slotting in for Mantha when needed. If Mantha is still hurt as yes. is, yeah, I'd have him there. But This is the kicker. I don't want much different. I want to see Cider at the end of the year. Also, we're going to talk about something happening at the end of the year, and I realized now, Brad, that we plan this out, we might not get to see Cider. We have so much time. It doesn't matter. No, 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 but when we go there. Oh, who cares? Um, anyways, Cider for a little bit. I want Zadina on the top line. That's it. While Mantha's hurt, Zadina on the top line. You keep Fabry, Athens, Sio, Phil Pula together. I legitimately don't care what you do with the bottom six. Keep them in the bottom six, whatever. Scratch Ernie. I'm not so torn up about Hiroshi not playing. Uh, I don't think he's been phenomenal. I would like to see him he's, over Ernie. He's just so much older than the rest of the prospects that I, I would rather him develop. He's the one guy I'd say, yeah, you probably need him in Detroit. Uh, for what it's worth, he played his first game as a Griffin tonight and scored. Nice. Cider had another assist on a such and a couple goals. Oh, too. God, Cider is the only thing we have good in this world. Joseph Delia says, hey guys, I got some bad news. I don't think we're going to make the playoffs. I know you guys are Canadian, but if you had another team to root for, who would it be for the World Juniors? Also, oh, Germany for sure. Germany for sure. Sider's probably going to be their captain. Uh, Sweden's going to be worth keeping an eye on because they've got two Red Wings on their roster with Berggren and Eliasson and maybe one more with Raymond and or Holtz. Uh, also, is there any lower grade prospects you guys were really high on that never panned out? Thanks, my dudes. Uh, uh, lower grade, so many over the years. Trying to think of a guy that I was pounding the table for that just didn't. There's guys that I had hope for. I'm not sure I was pounding the table. Like Kindle and Smith come to mind. Oh, are we talking Red Wings only? Uh, I mean, it could be anyone, but because <sighs> I've had a lot. There's a. It sucks because so many Red Wings have panned out. It's like, what do you have to be upset about? Like, yeah, this guy didn't pan out, but Datsuk and Zetterberg are still on your team, right? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I had I had big hopes for Sorry, Yarvi. Yeah, that would be my one, too, because I was pounding the table for him for a while, but he just never pieced it together. Uh, I hope he does it in Arizona for his sake, but... Cyril Robitsky says, I don't remember this being brought up on the pod before, but is this the worst Red Wings team of all time? By points percentage, they are ahead of only the 85, 86, and 76, 77 teams. Some of those Dead Wings teams were rough, but like the performance of this season is definitely up there. If you ever want to feel better about yourself, just go look at the Norris division in the 80s in general. Yeah. It, it, like There were teams missing, like making the playoffs uh, 12 points behind teams that missed the playoffs just because of the division setup. It was hilarious. Um, 
do, 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 Cyril went on to say, on a brighter note, there's been a lot of talk of Larkin's lack of production this year. However, according to Evolving Hockey, he's on pace to have the best year of his career by goals above replacement and expected goals plus minus. I wonder if this is a case of Larkin devoting more effort to the defensive end and doing the little things that help the team win but don't end up in the box score. That's definitely a big part of it. He has been very defensively responsible. Um, and this is a guy that carries the weight of these losses on his shoulders. So you know for a team that's struggling defensively, he is busting his butt defensively because there's no point of scoring one goal if you're letting in six, right? So I feel bad for him. Also, eh, as much as it sucks to say, people are going to like hearing it, when you have Glenn Denning and Helm on your line, you're not going to be as impactful. Yes. Everett Johnston. Johnston. Johnson. Everett Johnson, our friend. Sponsor of the show. It says, hey, Duds, welcome to round four of the Revisionist Wrangle. Today's subject is a bit of a depressing doozy. Oh, man, it's just me and Brad, so I'm not sure how to score this one. Uh, Evan's supposed to be the judge, so you, the listeners, are the judge instead. So Ryan and Brad prepared to wrangle. Think of what was, in your opinion, the worst ever unrestricted free agent signing by the Detroit Red Wings and explain why that is your choice. Evan, which of these free agent signings would you undo for the betterment of either the history of the team or the betterment of the current roster? That will determine this, the winner. Lastly, don't forget the dub, December 17th Winged Wheel Podcast ticket giveaway that will afford one lucky fan the opportunity to watch Gus Nyquist tear apart his former team from the second row of Section 116. The tickets that uh, are being given away through our uh, event sponsor, Everett, are phenomenal seats. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll be putting out a tweet soon uh, as to how to enter. Um, okay, so I can't think very far back in terms of terrible UFA signings because the – because the cap makes things different, right? The yeah, cap- yeah. So we basically, because before the cap, oh, you didn't, you overpaid a guy and he sucks. You just get rid of him. Who cares? And it's just money lost. So it's basically sends UFA. I've got two that come to mind, and I'm trying to think of which one is more egregious. Recency bias dictates that it's Abdulkader and Nielsen. Are we counting re-signings like Abdulkader? Oh, so it's Nielsen, and what other one are you thinking of? I'm thinking of Stephen Weiss. Oh, that one is bad. We're still paying him. We chose him over Phil Pilla. Now, that being said, we don't know Phil Pilla then. Phil Pilla chose to leave. Okay, that that makes it easier. But, yeah, paid Wait, $5 million. Phil Pilla chose to leave? It might be obvious now. Yeah, jeez. Uh, that being said, my answer is going to be Franz Nielsen. Uh, because the Red Wings were still competitive when we were looking at Weiss. Franz Nielsen's never seen a playoff game under this contract, and he's declined every year. And even at his best, he wasn't that good. He was third-line good at his peak with the Red Wings, which was the first year we signed him. Um, and there's still many years left. Uh, they had the common sense to buy out Weiss. Nielsen is bad, getting worse, stuck on the cap for a long, long time, and somehow wasn't even the worst contract signed in the NHL the day he signed. Somehow it wasn't even one of the worst three, which is horrifying. Um, yeah. I would also pick Franz Nielsen. I know I'm supposed to, for the sake of the game, defend uh, Stephen Weiss, but this is a guy who scored 20 goals, one, two, three, four times prior uh, in his, from 2005 to 2013 when he was on the Florida Panthers. Uh, when he came to the Red Wings, obviously was a shell of a player. Um, you know, he had that big concussion on that open ice hit when he was still in Florida. I can't remember who hit him. Yeah, they were just gambling with, oh, Weiss is injured, but when not injured, he's good. Let's try it. But Nielsen was always average. Nielsen played with a player who is one of the best in the league still at elevating the players around him, which is John Tavares. John Tavares got Franz they Nielsen. On the same line, did they? Uh, for a while, didn't they? I don't think so, because they were both centers. Doesn't matter. He was getting easier matchups because of Tavares. Regardless, uh, yeah, my, my vote would also go to Nielsen, so I guess I arbitrarily lose that round. Nick says, hey, guys, this is a bit of a conspiracy, but I'm starting to believe it. Hear me out. Often we hear only management tanks. Players and coaches are always trying to win. Likely this is a familiar phrase for you guys. Oh, man, we cover this exactly. So here's the thing. I think Blash is in on the tank with Eisenman. Some of the decisions that he makes seem so counterintuitive to winning hockey that there's no other explanation to me than that staff or... Uh, at least Blash is trying to lose. So a couple of bullet points. Man, you must have been fist pumping when I said this earlier in the show. Early in the season, the first line was on fire, and the team won three of the first four. What happened? Mantha's dropped to the second line to spread the offense, and the team started losing. Then the Fabry trade. First line goes back together, and the second line catches fire immediately and totally inexplicably broken up. 
Mantha Hurt, first line Glenny. Despite Zadina being one of the better players for the team and producing on the power play, he never gets a chance. So I started paying attention to it. Blashill has started the fourth line to start every game in period. He also seems to uh, like using the completely ineffectual Nielsen line after commercial breaks. Ooh, that's a good one. Given I've some of this stuff too. and other things that I'm sure I've missed, I'm recently starting to think that Blashill's helping the team lose. I may be 60-44. If Eisenman picks up the option, I think he'll believe it 100%. If Eisenman picks up the op- option, I'm with you 100%. We tend to live in a in an era of where we only focus on recency. A lot of these trends are not new for Plash Hill. He started the fourth line for years. He's always elevated the Darren Helms and the Justin Ablocators. These aren't new habits. It's almost like he's doubling down on them. I, I'm all for tinfoil hat conspiracy theories. I live for them. Not really, but whatever. I'll hear them out. But I just... I don't see it. I think this is just incompetence. I, if he gets extended, then I know that maybe it's true. I, I'm, I'm with you there, but if he's let go, no, then this is honestly what he was trying to do. Uh, Sean Chabarella says, hey, guys, I coach a minor Adam, or I guess U10 hockey team just north of Toronto. We're going to go. Uh, we're going to a tournament by Windsor this weekend. That's yeah, my hometown. And part of our plan is we're going to take the team to a Wings game Saturday. For many of these kids, it's their first live NHL game. It's also my first visit to Little Caesars. My question is, what do you guys uh, – what to you guys is uh, what would be a must-do or must-see at Little Caesars with a large group of nine-year-olds? Look, that facility is one of the best buildings that you can go to in the world. The way they have it laid down is you can legitimately walk in circles around the arena and see something that catches your attention. Have fun. Uh, see the memorabilia. See the different uh, art displays they have. See the giant banners. See the murals, um, the, the statues. Walk out to the ice and watch the uh, – look at the red lighting uh, – uh, on the like it's all laid out so incredibly cool they have a ton of good food there too uh, they really don't do much for kids there though now that i'm thinking about it not really um but detroit as is a very experienced hockey city so they have a lot of old fans coming like these fans have grown up these are generations of red wings fans um there's sit down restaurants there's like takeaway stuff there's usual arena food I would say get there as early as you can, like doors open. If you can, I don't know what it's like wrangling nine-year-olds for that long. Um, there's there's something enjoyable. And if you guys are driving past, go look at the shell of Jolos Arena. It's pretty sad. Uh, Joseph you Fournier me. says, welcome to the next phase of the Athens U one-for-one trade game, phase two. I just want to say, nothing makes you question your knowledge of hockey more than this game, because you have to remember so much about so many players on the spot, and I'm like, is he good or bad? I'm questioning myself. It's like when you hear a word too many times and you're like, that's not a real word anymore, is it? Uh, below is half of the list of players you guys agreed by majority that you would trade Athens U one for one for. Assuming, assuming you are the general manager for the teams each player below plays for, would you trade your player one for one for Athens U? So we're if the opposing if we're the opposing team's GM, do we trade this guy for Athens U? Okay. Evan Bouchard. No. No, I don't do it. Dylan Cousins. No. No. Trevor Zegras. No. Cam Fowler. No. No, they're hurting on defense, right? Doesn't matter. No. Josh Morrissey. No. no. They just lost Bufflin. Kyle Connor. No. no. Noah Dobson. No. Really? No, you're not trading Noah Dobson for Athens if you're the Islanders. Barrett Hayton. Uh, no. If I'm Shaka with how high I took him, no. Ivan Provorov. No. No, I wish. Philip Broberg. Yeah, I'd do that if I'm no, Holland. I wouldn't. You need a scoring winger. Dude, there's going to be a pattern here, man. If I said yes to Athens U, it meant we were getting a good deal, meaning the other team was not getting a good deal. These should be universal no's. But if you're Holland, you consider mortgaging Broberg, maybe. No. Eric Brandstrom, no. No. Spencer Knight, no. No. Especially not with how Bob's playing now. Uh, Rasmus Sandin, no. no. They're hurt. They don't need more. They'll have, where do you put him? Martin Nikash, hell no. No. Nick Suzuki, no. no. Nolan Patrick. Okay, that's an interesting one. Still no, but that's an interesting. Uh, one. yeah, that one I would consider given his. If you want to bail on him, yeah, that's that's the first maybe. Max Domi, no, no. J T Miller, no, no. Oh, no. J T Miller is not as old as we think. Jamie I think he's, this is the second time I've done this. I think he's only a couple of years older. Twenty six. Yeah. Tomash Hurdle, hell, effing no. God, no. No. Jesus, no. 
Stay fresh cheese bags. Ryan Kearns says, so I counted and the Wings got a total of eight points out of a possible 32 in November, all of which came during the five games after the Fabry trade. So not too great. Wings have a possible 24 points available in December, including the two already given up uh, to the Islanders. I'll set the over-under at five and a half points. Place your bets. Under. Over. Ryan Avina says, uh, hey, gents, with the Taylor Hall uh, on the trade block, what does Eisenman give up to guarantee the number one pick in the draft? <laughs> oh, man. I hope New Jersey trades Taylor Hall so they don't win because they don't win the, the draft lottery Taylor Hall does. Um... Trick. If you're giving up, the, if you're getting the number one overall but pick, it, but he'll be a UFA at the draft. <gasps> That's true. That's dun, true. Dun. Rowan says, "Good day, Dud Duds." I'm going to assume this is another episode where you three, good old Ontario boys, yeah, three, good joke, stifle hockey visionary Mel by not giving her a voice on your show. What's even more worrying is overly controlling. Crying Ryan is tweeting for her. Will she enslaves her? Will he enslaves her to fix his house? I'll be honest. It is sounding like she has Stockholm syndrome and needs rescuing. Do any of our listeners live near the KW area and can do a safety check on her? Please reach out to me on Twitter and I'll give you the address. Uh, we moved, so I don't think you have it anymore. Also, I agree with Arjun above that you three need a swear jar. A- anytime probationary constable Rob mentions the Bills or his beloved stars, that's a loony or a toonie in the jar. You spelt them wrong, you dummy. Uh, Evan, if you mention being tired or golf, you're on the hook. Ryan, just prepay each episode. <laughs> then uh, give a cash... Run a cash giveaway for the patrons as the, at the end of the season. Simples. Back-to-back nights without a Red Wings loss. Feels good, you know. Jersey time. Islander, old fisherman jersey. Love or hate, go. Say fresh cheese bags. I live for pure 90s bullshit. 100% agree. I think if we can find love for the Kachina, which is objectively beautiful, I was wrong in the past about it, we can find love for the Islanders jersey, which is not the same kind of objective beauty, but should be treasured the same way we treasured the Mighty Ducks logo. It's like... That old fisherman jersey is like using uh, stupid slang, ironically, and then it's working its way into your category, and then all of a sudden you're saying dope as an adult human being. Oh, no. Yeah. That's a, that that was, was a lot of reality, right? Oh, no. <laughs> this is too much reality for 11. Did you have to pick a word I've actually been using? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> I asshole. did that to you, actually. <sighs> With that, uh, we are going to try to finish before midnight, and we have a minute and 10 seconds to spare. We want to thank all... All of our listeners, our name level sponsors, our uh, business sponsors with Labatt and Motor City Garages. Our name level sponsors are, as soon as it loads, Luke Johnson, Arjun Shanker, Clayton Van Dyken, Mike Reed, Aaron, T- Aaron Taylor, Langabeer, Matthew M. Rice, Ryan Lewis, Sean Levine, Matt McKay, Hannah Lee, Kaylin Wood, Jacob Turner, Charlie Elkins, John Evans, Rob Thiel. Craig Kibble, Stan Olson, Ryan Lewis, and Simon Anderson, our Swedish friend. Thank you all so much. Maybe this Sunday we'll be in the new studio. It won't be all decorated yet. We have to wait for Mel uh, to help us with that. And currently she is, as Rowan said, legitimately building our washroom. Uh, And I'm in desperate need of a shower. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.